Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do, to educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only, to learn, to teach, and to love. Love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Welcome to the show, everyone. Today's show, I want to cover a topic that... um, is sort of near and dear to my heart. And I think it's something that all of us humans think about and are dealing with uh, on the unconscious level, whether we are aware of it or not. And this is this idea of who we are becoming or our future selves. And this idea of how do we become our best selves? Now, obviously, this is the Next Level Human podcast. And so Built into the name of Next Level Human, my Next Level Human work, the Next Level Human company is really about this idea of, um, you know, personal transcendence, personal growth, becoming our best selves. And from my perspective, we don't have a whole lot of understanding of what this person is. And so what I want to frame this up as is this idea of a parts integration uh, work, work that comes from sort of the shamans who don't see us necessarily as just one single entity, but sees us as multiple entities. And this idea that um, even in psychology, when you look at parts integration work, is this idea that there are parts of ourselves that are still alive from a psychological Perspective. And so I want to go that through that first because, from my perspective, what we miss is that there's another part of ourselves that we don't always think about that is very much alive in our psychology, in our psyche, and that is our future self. So let's talk about some of the selves that psychology oftentimes talk about. So you probably heard this idea of the little child self and being in dialogue with, let's say, the wounded child or being in dialogue with the rejected adolescent or the rejected teen, or being in dialogue with our adult self, the betrayed adult self, or the regretful adult self. In other words, we as humans have this sort of uh, idea that we are who we are right now in the moment. But what we don't understand is that we are not really who we are in the present moment. We are a conglomeration, a synthesis right, of all aspects of ourselves that came before. And we oftentimes don't think about ourselves this way because as we go from, let's say, you know, our childhood years from zero to 10 years old, let's say, to our teenage years from sort of 10 to 20 years old and then our early sort of adulthood, you know, our early, our 20s, you know, and then our 30s and our 40s and as we grow, we have different aspects of ourselves. I mean, let's just think back for a little while. Let's just go back to your teenage self, your 18-year-old self, your 20-year-old self, and think about the passions, your personality, uh, the different aspects of yourself, especially if you are now in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and ask yourself, how much of that are you the same? And I would argue that most of us probably would like to say, hey, I used to be this way and now I'm this way, which says we've essentially grown. And I oftentimes talk about this idea that the kind of life we probably want to live as next level humans is not lives that I've always wanted to, but lives of I've used to. So in other words, in the future, we don't want to be someone that's like, oh, my God, I always wanted to do that. And I didn't. 
I always wanted to be this and I didn't. I always wanted to uh, have this experience, but I never did. What we probably are going to want is we want to be used to people. Oh my God, I used to be someone who's afraid of this. Oh my God, I used to be someone who had this pattern. Oh my gosh, I used to be someone who never thought I could do X, Y, and Z. And the idea is growth built into that, right? Like someone who goes, I always wanted to, um, that speaks to the fact that fears, failures, uh, situations kept them from doing that. People who say I used to are people who essentially uh, worked and grew and achieved certain things and were in this sort of growth sort of mindset. Now, from my perspective, when we talk about the future self, we can't really talk about this future self without understanding this sort of parts aspect of us, that there is a younger part of us that has wounds, that speaks to us, that has a personality. There's a teenage part of us that speaks to us, that has wounds, that has a personality, that has strengths, that is in dialogue with us, whether we want to believe that or not. And that also there is this future self that we should be in dialogue with, but we oftentimes aren't. And so let's unpack this idea a little bit. So first of all, think about our subconscious mind. I talk a lot about the idea of seed stories. Now, what do I mean by seed stories? These are stories that we write in our subconscious when we are younger, usually between the ages of zero to 10 years old. We write a lot of these things because we are mostly unconscious between the, the ages of zero to six. And we're, especially when we're very young, we're just a big ball of sensations and things happen and we can't always explain them logically. So we make decisions around these things. Now, our child self is usually a self that is concerned with or writing stories about safety and security. Uh, you probably heard me talk about the idea of base level humans. This isn't like they're basic and aren't smart or anything like that, but just that the base sort of understanding or the base development of feeling safe and secure in the, in the world was arrested to some degree. And so if you operate from your base level, when you're operating from your base level, this sort of reactive fight, flight, freeze type of reaction. This is really reacting from the child self and reacting from things that are safety and security oriented. And so that part of us can live and certainly with adverse childhood experiences, the so-called ACEs, adverse childhood events or ad adverse childhood experiences, we can uh, have traumatic events that happen as a child that write into our subconscious uh, stories. And these stories will be stories about safety and security, like life isn't safe. You need to defend yourself. You need to be on guard. You need to, uh, you know, always be ready to run. You need to, you know, understand that people aren't going to take care of you and you can only you're only going to be able to take care of yourself or people only respond to X, Y, Z. We write these stories. And, and the analogy I like to give is that when these things happen, these traumatic events in our lives, it's like having this string of yarn that we tie a knot in. And then what happens is that knot, the tie, uh, gets another knot tied on top and another knot tied on top and another one until you have this big ball of yarn. And we do this because this is our way of coping. And that knot is an analogy for a story, a seed story. And this seed story is the uh, sort of underpinnings of this particular developmental self. So, for example, your inner child, this child that you have living inside of you, in a sense, that is a part of you, this child has stories that it has written. And these stories uh, got written on top of and one knot was tied on top of another, on top of another, until you had this big ball of yarn. And that is who you are today. And you are being influenced by these deep knots. Now, many people would call this kind of work and looking for these deep knots as shadow work, uh, subconscious work. Some people would be, you know, looking at this from a perspective of just trauma. But we do this all the time. And some of these things can work for us and some of them may not. But we are constantly writing these stories, what we're most interested in when we're looking at our future self is we're looking at, can we 
unwind the stories that our child wrote? And can we unwind the stories that our teenage self wrote? And can we unwind the stories that our, you know, young 20s, 20 year old selves wrote so that we can free ourselves from repeating these patterns? I often talk about this idea that most of us are sort of in this resistance phase of life, repeated patterns, recurrent struggles stuck emotions, obstacles that we bump into again and again. And these are signs that we have these seed stories written deep in our unconscious. And what most of us do is we stay authentic to those stories. And a lot of our culture even celebrates this kind of stuff, right? It's this idea that there's almost a celebration that this person hasn't changed much or that they have the same beliefs that they always had. When in reality, If we want to change and be our best selves, we should always be trying to level up next level human. But how can we do that if we are in dialogue with past selves, if we are being driven by these underlying seed stories that we've never looked at? And how do we begin to do this differently? Hey, everybody, jumping into the show real quick to talk about one of our sponsors. This is one of my favorite sponsors. You've heard about it. AG1 by Athletic Greens. Now, why do I love this product so much? Well, first of all, one of the things that I was doing prior to AG1 was I was doing a multivitamin. I was doing a probiotic. I was taking a fiber supplement. I was taking adaptogens and I was taking a greens drink. And of course, I take other supplements. But AG1, one of the things that's so powerful about this greens product is that it is a multivitamin prebiotic, probiotic, it has adaptogens in it, and it acts as my greens drink. So when I started taking this, I had five supplements that I could essentially get rid of just for this one. So there were a lot of savings there. But the other thing about this product, and many of you know this about me, is I am not somebody, unfortunately, and I know I'm in the health and fitness space, and it's kind of embarrassing to say, but I'm not somebody who loves vegetables. I don't always get my greens in. And so I want the extra assurance of all those polyphenols and all those plant chemicals that really bioflavonoids and all the rest that really bring health benefits to us. And these things are loaded in AG1. And so I add this into my water and believe it or not, I add it into my protein shakes as well because it has such a neutral flavor. And one of the reasons I started using AG1, just as a reminder, is other greens drinks that use tapioca starch and things like that will elevate my blood sugars. Now, AG1 does not do that. And it's got this very neutral flavor so I can stick it in my protein shakes and take it in water as well. The other thing I love about AG1 is they're fanatical about testing. They are NSF certified. That's the National Sanitation Foundation. And they test for heavy metals. They test for persistent organic pollutants. They test for all other harmful chemicals of industry. And here's the thing. The fact of the matter is this testing is not cheap. And so a lot of people don't do this. And if you think you are safe, just go to consumerlabs.com or any of these organizations that are testing products. And you will find out pretty quickly that a lot of these products that we think we are doing something good for our health with are not testing. And you're having heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, forever chemicals showing up in them. You know, AG1 is on their 52nd integration of this product. So they continue to innovate. They continue to tweak. They continue to make it better. It is an excessively clean product through this testing and this constant uh, sort of reintegration and uh, making this product better. And so I cannot recommend this product strongly enough. This is one of the ones that I think every single person should get and be taking every single day. Like I said, it's got multiple benefits. And so to make it easy for you, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of an immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com backslash next level. Again, that is athleticgreens.com backslash next level to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, let's get back to the show. 
And so the way I like to unpack this is to look at ourselves and essentially say, okay, look, there's me today, right? My current adult self. And then there's my past adult selves. And then there's my teenage slash adolescent self. And there's my little child self. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the patterns in my life, the ones that recur again and again, the ones that repeat, the struggles that come up again and again, the obstacles that seem to present themselves to me again. And these usually show up, by the way, inside of our four jobs. So we'll see these repeated patterns, recurrent obstacles, stuck emotions, uh, struggles that happen again and again and again. We'll usually see these in four areas. We'll see them in sort of our finance and career. We'll see them in our health and fitness. We'll see them in our personal relationships and romance. And we'll see them in our uh, feelings of mattering and making a difference, purpose and meaning in these four jobs. And the idea is then, if we're seeing repeated patterns, recurrent obstacles, stuck emotions, from my perspective, what this is essentially saying is, you are identifying with and being authentic to a past self and a past story. In other words, your present self is being influenced to such a degree by your past history and the stories you wrote about what life is like that you're unable to get in touch with any possible future reality to be better. And so what I would suggest as a sort of way of beginning to tackle this is beginning to see yourself as different parts so that you can get in dialogue with your child self and essentially go, okay, like, you know, for me, my little child, let's say, is JD. And I'm going to give JD a name and JD has a particular personality. And little JD has some issues that he dealt with as a child. He had a mother who was incredibly loving. So he never had to wonder whether he was loved or not. But he also had a mother that was incredibly emotionally volatile. She had a lot of struggles growing up. So emotionally speaking, my little Jade self never knew what he was going to get. One minute, things would be fine. The next minute, everything was bad. So one of the things, stories he wrote is he wrote the story of one, women are, is, women's emotions are not to be trusted. Be careful of people's emotions because they might be happy one day, but they don't really mean it. So that might be one story I wrote. Don't trust people's emotions, especially women, right? Because I got that, you know, sort of from my mother. The other thing is, uh, be a good boy. Uh, you know, pretend everything's okay. Uh, you know, remain quiet. Try to do the nice thing. Be kind. All of these things. Uh, so, my little JD self was sort of a people pleasing self and a self that was a little bit on edge and sort of felt that he was at fault a lot. And he had to sort of walk on eggshells and be a good boy. And that follows me into my older self. Now, my teenage self was a self of uh, dynamics around my brothers, especially my second oldest brother, Keone. Uh, Keone and me had, uh, were both kind of competitive. I was looking to my brother to, uh, you know, sort of accept me and take me along. And I was copying a lot of what he was doing, but he was merciless to me in terms of teasing me and, you know, borderline bullying me. Of course, you know, from Keone's perspective and me and him are very close now from his perspective, you know, he was just having fun. Like I was sort of his comic relief. But for me as a, as a, you know, 10 to, you know, to sort of 20 year old, I had a very uh, uh, tough relationship with him because I felt like he was always picking on me and never truly accepting me. So that story fits in there. And I need to be in dialogue with that and understand. So this then explained why I was so mad, why I was so competitive, why I was somewhat rebellious and lashed out, uh, why I also didn't trust guys, most most men. Uh, And these stories then follow me into my adulthood. And then, of course, I can begin to look at my patterns and see, oh, well, you kept, uh, you know, you weren't honest with most of the women you dated. You tried to just protect their emotions. You didn't speak up about your own needs. A lot of times you also kept them at arm's distance. You kind of stiff armed them. All of this can go back to that dialogue of my child self feeling somewhat unsafe and not secure with my mother's dynamics. Now, of course, This is not about blaming anybody or anything like that. And it's not even about reality, right? This may or may not have been the case 
in reality. However, my perception, my little Jade saw it this way. It's the story that he wrote. For example, I oftentimes laugh when I look at my family background. I had a uh, three, I was one of four and I was the youngest. So I had the oldest was my older brother, Kimo. And to me, the story I wrote about him was that he was the smart one, because to me, that's what I thought everyone was saying about him. Uh, my brother Keone was the one who was the good looking one. That's the story I wrote about him. And my sister Jody was the kind one, the supportive one, because that's the story I wrote about her. Now, if you talk to my family, they might have written different stories or they may not see it that way. But this is the way little Jade saw this which then left me as a young boy to try to figure out what my part in the family was. And so I adopted the tough guy athlete. So I was the athlete and I played into that role. What I didn't realize until much later in studying psychology is that was a story that I told myself. All of that was a perceptual story, tr whether true or not. And that part of myself, I carried. Now, here's what to think about as we start getting into getting in dialogue with your future self. Now, imagine that I never spotted that story, right? For a long time, as I was coming up through high school and, uh, you know, until I got into college, I essentially saw myself as the dumb jock story. I was good at athletics. I wasn't very smart. Uh, no one saw me that way. And I was just a dummy. And now imagine I, I rewrote that story, uh, but I was lucky to, in a sense. And I rewrote that story because I just made a choice. I spotted it. And as a matter of fact, it was through some pretty painful things that happened to me. Uh, and I'll walk you through this really quickly because this is important as we start to dialogue with our future selves. And so this dumb jock, Jade, who was carrying his young child wounds and his teenage wounds with him in his senior year, I essentially um, got called into the office early in my senior year and was confronted with all of the days. I missed probably half my days of school my junior year. And um, the, and I, I was starting to skip school again. As a matter of fact, I would skip school and go and then go come back to football practice. Long story short, you know, of course, the school calls my family, tells my mother and father what's going on. Now, my mother and father, funnily enough, stood up for me and essentially said, we're aware of Jade's absences. They actually weren't. But when I got home, my dad essentially sat me down and just said, look, you know, my father has always been pretty amazing, but he was very honest. And he essentially said, look, I've got, you know, you're my fourth kid. You're, you know, in, in the most loving way possible, you're a fuck up. You know, you're going to have to decide what you're going to be and what you're going to do. Now, the beautiful thing about my father is I believe in you. He said, I love you. But that doesn't make a difference. At some point, you're going to have to believe in you and you're going to have to do something different because this is not going to get you what you want. And so that was the first thing that happened. The other thing that happened was one of my teenage, uh, one of my te one of my teachers uh, also early on to me in hindsight, this seemed to have happened probably the same week. But who knows? It's pretty close back to back. Uh, so I got called to the office. You know, they were telling me, you know, you're not you're you're, you're you know, we may not graduate you or whatever they were telling me. My dad, you know, essentially calls me a loser, but he loves me and he believes me. Then this teacher, my high school English teacher, essentially tell, you know, tells me uh, that I'm a loser. I'm never going to get into college. And all of these things at once happen. Now, you might say there's two ways you can go with this. And this is where I was lucky. And I think this is where having a loving family and brothers and sisters who actually did believe in me made a difference. At that point, I said, OK. I need to do something different. I can't be the dumb jock. Now, I didn't know if I was smart or not. But one of the weird things that happened, and this is going to go right into our future selves. This is long before I ever studied psychology. I just decided uh, in a very strange way to make a very strong right hand turn. And I did a couple things. First thing I did made things a lot worse. I quit uh, the football team. Now, that was the only thing I was good at. You know, so, of course, no one was happy about that. And I don't even know why I did it, except some part of me, my future self, thought that this was the move I needed to make. I quit football. I started to dress differently and I started to read. Now, of course, at the time, I had never really picked up a book through school and I started reading muscle magazines and things like that. You know, that's all I read. But I started to read different books at that point, you know, and I started to, to read and pick up reading. And I decided 
that I was going to um, become something different, that I was going to be smart. I even went out and got glasses, started dressing more sharp and got glasses. I didn't even wear glasses at the time. So I just got glasses without frames and started wearing glasses around school. It's time for one of our sponsors. And this sponsor is a very exciting one and a new one. Timeline Nutrition and their supplement Mito Pure. Now, if I was going to ask you what is the most important aspect of metabolism, the mitochondria would have to be tops on your list. The mitochondria are the little energy producing factories inside every single one of your cells. They take the end products of the food we eat, they break them down into cellular ATP and provide energy for the entire metabolism. And these mitochondria, if they are healthy and acting appropriately, can keep us looking good, feeling good, living longer, and functioning better. However, when they are not at optimal function, when they are burning energy in a dirty fashion, when they are damaged, they actually speed cellular aging. They speed up the aging process. We end up suffering from things like fatigue. We end up having all manner of dysfunctions, including weight loss resistance and other issues around weight loss. The mitochondria are the most important elements for the metabolism to function optimally, lose weight, age appropriately, et cetera. In this compound, MitoPure, that Timeline Nutrition has developed, there is a product called Urolithin A. Now, Urolithin A is an interesting compound because it is a postbiotic. Now, what does that mean? A postbiotic is a compound that is made from the bacteria in the gut. And so when you eat things like pomegranates, strawberries, walnuts, things with polyphenols like this, they go into the digestive tract, your gut bacteria start working on them, and they can create compounds. Urolithin A is one compound that is in the MitoPure product. It comes from, naturally occurs in nature from this bacteria in our gut that break down the polyphenols from primarily foods like pomegranates, strawberries, etc. And it can increase mitophagy in mitochondria. So you might say, well, Jade, what is mitophagy? Mitophagy is the ability for mitochondria to repair and regenerate and recycle their proteins and to stay healthy and functional and de-age. When we can stimulate mitophagy, we can keep our mitochondria functioning efficiently. We can decrease aging. We can increase energy. We can improve our ability to lose weight, function optimally, and stave off diseases of aging. This is what Timeline Nutrition has done with their MitoPure product and the urolithin A that is in it. This is a very exciting area of research. We have not had the ability to support the mitochondria in the way that we do now with this particular product. You definitely are going to want to check this out. I've been taking the product for several months now. It is one of these products that I really, really strongly recommend. To get the product, MitoPure, all you have to do to, is go to TimelineNutrition.com backslash next level. TimelineNutrition.com backslash next level. And let's get back to the show. Now, the funny thing about this is a little too late because this is my senior year. But all of a sudden, as I'm looking in the mirror, and looking at my life, I'm no longer going to football practice. I'm dressing different. I look different and I'm carrying around books and I'm acting the part of this smart kid. And don't even ask me why I did this. And by the way, this really didn't go over well with anyone because at least people thought I was a good athlete and I was sort of in this place. But what I was doing at the time is really interesting because I got in dialogue with my future Jade. And this is this idea of be it until you see it versus fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it is not something I like because to me, fake it means when people are watching, you're doing the thing. And when people aren't watching, you're not. Be it means you just jump in full speed and you start playing this part. So I was being it. I wasn't faking because I wasn't, you know, going and playing football or being the jock. I was actually reading the books. I was actually dressing different. I was actually intent on doing something different. I even started to look on how to study. And because I was in this state, uh, I found this, this, uh, I forget what, I think where there's a will, there's an A was the name of this program that just sort of 
fell on me. It's almost like when you start being different, you start seeing things different. I, whether that would have been could have been handed to me when I was the dumb jock story, I wouldn't have paid attention. But now that I was, you know, sort of the smart jock story and, and rewriting my story, as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, I need that. And I devoured this thing. Now, what do you think happened? Now, all of a sudden, I'm in this place where there's this dumb jock story I've been living. Uh, and I've got this sort of a child wound and this teen wound that fed into this dumb jock story. And now all of a sudden I'm living and interacting completely different. I'm not this thing yet, but when I look in the mirror, I can see, I can see glimpses of a future Jade. And I started to just think of myself differently. One of the things that happened though, that is always a setback is once you start to like be it until you see it, it doesn't mean the world automatically uh, you know, f- sort of fixes things for you. In fact, it oftentimes tests you. And one of the tests I've got was that all the schools and colleges I applied to turned me down except one. And it was basically the worst school in the state. Uh, people called this, it was called East Carolina University, ECU. People called it easy you because they, you know, essentially they let anyone in. I got waitlisted everywhere else. All my friends went to all their schools that they wanted to go to. I got waitlisted. I went to easy you, ECU. <laughs> and I forget, forgive me for people who also went to East Carolina University, but back in, uh, you know, this would have been 90, late 90s, or I'm sorry, early 90s. Uh, I graduated high school in 92. This was the reputation of this university. And uh, essentially, again, this was, I could have seen this as like, oh, this is your past self. You're a dumb jock. You couldn't get into any colleges. But instead, I was more of the mindset of like any college I get into, what am I going to do? I'm going to be a smart kid. I'm going to study. I had, I had studied this thing. I knew how to study now. And I went away to school. And what I did was study. I went to the gym and I studied and I read. And I basically became this person who was just, just like I used to approach football. I approached studying that way. And I ended up making a straight, straight A's. I was the first person in my family to do that my first semester. And this is where the be it turned into the see it. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, I actually am smart and I can do this. And all of that was possible because I became in dialogue with my future self. I started to be it until you see it. But in order for me to be it, I had to have a clear vision and intention of what I was going to be. And then I had to essentially begin living into that and playing that role. And what ends up happening here is instead what most of us do most of the time when we're trying to change is we do not understand that we are different parts. So, look, I still have that dumb jock in me. I still have that wounded child in me. I still have that angry teenager in me. I still have all of these parts in me. And what I do is I oftentimes do dialogue with them in a sense. Not in that I have multiple personalities, but then I can relate to these things. I can tap into these things. But what I've also learned is that I also can be in dialogue with my future self. And I can be in dialogue with that Jade and be in conversation with that Jade and be in intentionality and clarity in what that Jade looks like. Now, the reason I'm having this discussion is because when we talk about our future selves and we talk about self-development, what most people will do is they'll essentially say, be in the present and that's where you should live. And of course, a lot of philosophies talk about this too. But from my perspective, when you're looking at your future self, this is sort of the wrong way to do this because the right way to do this is that the present moment is really where your creative sort of process comes from. There's no real such thing as the present. If you take away the past and you take away the future, there's no such thing as the present. So the present is absolutely dependent on the past and the future. And in a sense, these are like different dimensions in a sense, right? And perhaps the whole arrow of of time for us humans is to illustrate this point that we are essentially our present selves are essentially taking all the lessons from the past selves. And then from that place, taking all that information and all those lessons and essentially saying, what is my potential forward? And then being in dialogue with those people. So in a sense, what you're doing is when you're saying be authentic to yourself, what are you really saying here? 
Well, we don't want to be authentic to a past self. I don't want to be authentic to the wounded child and the authentic to the um, angry teenager and authentic to the dumb jock. I also don't want to be authentic to the current jade because I'm, I'm trying to change. What I want to be is authentic to my next level best self. And being authentic to that person doesn't mean that I essentially take all my other parts, my current self, my past selves, and discard them. What it means is I integrate them. And this is the whole idea of getting trapped in our past or getting trapped in our present. In my contention, if you want to become something different, you can't just live in the present. You definitely can't live in the past. What you want to do is you want to create from the present so that you can live into the future. But in order to do that, you need to be in dialogue with what this future personality looks like in the same way you're going to be in dialogue with the little JD self, you know, my child self and my teen self and the different aspects of myself from the past. And what happens is as you begin to get in touch with this idea of this becoming your future self, you start to understand that really who you are is a work in progress. And this is a critical understanding to have because then what happens is you start to identify with the being and becoming rather than the beliefs and identities from your past. Think about it. How many of us go, I'm this way. I would never do that way. I like this. I don't like that. I've always been this. I've always been that. Well, those are sort of spells in a sense, right? We're convincing ourselves we're this. We're also telling ourselves we don't want to change. And, we're, and that is a form of dialogue with our current selves and our past selves that probably is not helping us in any meaningful way become the next level humans we want. And so what I'm trying to say here is that we must become in dialogue with all the parts of ourselves, but most importantly, the future part of ourselves. And the future part of ourselves is an integrated self. It's a self that takes all of the previous selves along with the current self and then projects out into the future that this is who I will be. Now, here's one of the things that people get hung up on. The future obviously is uncertain. What we have to understand is that we are co-creators. We are not creators. We are co-creators. What do I mean by that? What I mean is we have choice, but also life has choice. In other words, life happens. Some things are just out of our control, but other things are in our control. And we have to work with what life gives us and what life gave us in the past, right? So we have to work with the present circumstances. We have to work with what we've been giving in the past. And then we have to project out and realize that we can't control certain things and that our future self is can never be completely exactly what we think. And so we can't say, I'm going to be X, Y, Z and this, this and that. What we have to say is, I want to feel this way and I want to generally have this way of being in this life, right? And then we begin to live into that. And this is what I call the difference between directive intention versus collaborative intention. Directive intention for the future self says, I will be A, B, and C and X, Y, and Z by this, by this time, by three years from now, right? I'm going to look this way, have this, have a million dollars, you know, be lean, you know, have, be healthy, you know, have a beautiful partner, you know, be deeply in my purpose and meaning and doing my work by this amount of time. And it's going to look exactly like this. Collaborative intention essentially says, I'm going to feel a particular way. I'm going to have these values. I am going to live into this idea of my four jobs where I will work, I will be healthy and fit and vital. And instead of seeing that, I will feel what that feels like. Same thing in my finances, same thing in my personal relationships. The difference though, is I'm not saying I'm going to look exactly like this. Or I'm going to have th exactly this account, kind of money. Or I'm going to have, you know, a beautiful wife with brunette hair and green eyes or whatever it is, right? Instead, it's saying, I am going to work on becoming and being this in the moment. And I'll see where life gets me. What's going on, everybody? Jumping into the show really quick. It's time to cover a sponsor. And this is a new sponsor that I'm pretty excited about. Let me give you a little background on this. You may not know this about me, but back when I was in medical school at naturopathic medical school, uh, I actually was a consultant for one of the leading spas 
and skin therapy spas in uh, Seattle, Washington. And one of my jobs there is that I was looking at research on all the things that were really good for skin. And back then, this was in the mid to late 90s, there was kind of not really much going on with skincare. And uh, this was the beginning of some of the skin lines actually coming out and putting botanicals and antioxidants and all of these kinds of things in their products. And so these, these were like topical uh, supplements that people were actually putting in to their skincare lines and putting on the skin. And one of my jobs was to really look at that research. Well, we've come a long way since then. The only issue is that most of these companies that are really doing a good job on this stuff are mostly for women. You don't see a lot of male uh, lines for skincare. The other thing about skincare that really kind of drives me nuts is you get these two types, right? You get these sort of skincare products that are for the masses that really have just a ton of icky stuff in them, uh, you know, compounds that you really do not want to be putting on your skin. And that's one, you know, side of the equation. And the other side of the equation is these companies that are essentially putting nothing but natural agents on your skin, uh, things like coconut oil and harsh clays and this kind of stuff that even though they're natural, they can be pretty occlusive for the skin and, uh, you know, cause some issues for the skin. And so this is why I'm excited about this particular sponsor. This sponsor is called Dara Labs. They specialize in male skincare. And in my opinion, they get this right. They take the best of the natural compounds with the best of current science and none of the toxic stuff goes in their particular products. And they are combining these products for men in particular. The other thing I love about Caldera Labs is they are actually doing their own testing. And so one of the studies that they have done uh, that has been released is they took 50 some men all between the ages of 35 and 65 and basically had them go through their major product line daily using their cleanser, their uh, base layer moisturizer, uh, and then their uh, you know serum at night. And after eight weeks, they looked at uh, subjectively what the men thought of their skin. But they also used analyzing technology to analyze acne, wrinkles, um, you know, uh, color dis discoloration on the skin, et cetera. And what they found was an 89% improvement in radiance and luminosity in male skin, 87% improvement in fine lines and wrinkles, and more even skin tone in 85%. Now, in terms of the men actually liking what they saw, 96% reported that they felt their skin looked healthy. 91% said their skin was less dry. And 91% said they had smoother skin. Now, one of the things about this is not only is Caldera Labs using the best of natural agents and modern science, they are actually testing their stuff. So from my perspective, this is what we want. I have started using these products I'm about two or three weeks in right now. I'm really liking what I am seeing. And this is why I have partnered with Caldera Labs for you men to have a good line of skincare. I laugh about this. A lot of my girlfriends and friends laugh about this, but I love facials. I love skincare. I love anything that has to do with, you know, reducing the appearance of aging. You know, I don't know, call me a little vain, but I think Caldera Labs is getting this right. And they have a special code for you for listeners of my podcast. You can go to calderalab.com, get 20% off their best products, use the code JADE, or you can go to calderalab.com slash JADE. And if you're asking me, hey, Jade, what should I get? Well, what I'm using right now is I'm using their base cleanser. That's the clean slate, the base moisturizer, and I use those in the morning. And then at night, I use the clean slate again. And then I use the serum, the good. I have pretty oily skin, so I use a couple drops of that. And one of the things I really like is they have this product called the Icon, which, let's fake it, face it, as we age, you know, puffy eyes, uh, you know, bags under the eyes, those kinds of things. And so I'm really keen on this Icon. I've been using this in the morning and the night under my eyes for fine line, dark circles, and puffiness under the eyes. Go over to calderalab.com slash Jade. Check out what they have to offer. Use the code Jade on checkout for 20% off. And definitely let me know 
what you think. And thank you so much to Caldera Lab for getting into the male skin care space. We've been needing you and I'm happy you're here. Let's get back to the show. This is collaborative intention because it's essentially saying my future self is over here someone, somewhere, but it's still kind of blurry. And I'm going to allow it to come in focus as I create from the present moment. And as I create with my past selves informing who I want to be. So in a very real sense, what I'm saying about the future self and getting in dialogue with the future self is that you're making a friend that you are essentially getting to know. That's what I mean by blurry. This, this friend, it's almost like this friend where you've texted with them, you've talked to them on the phone, you know, you've sort of seen pictures of themselves, but they're, sev- they're from several years ago. You have a general idea of what they're like, but when you meet them for the first time, you know, outside of the internet or the phone or texting, you get to really understand who they are. And then over time, they become more and more clear. This is the dialogue you want to be with in, with your future self. Because the more you try to make them a solid, predictable thing, the more you keep yourself from allowing that future self to become and evolve as you create. And so the point here is that who should we be authentic to? We should be authentic to our next level human potential. And that's what it is. It's a potential. And it's a way of being, right? This potential of being something that I can't quite clearly see yet, but I know its main elements because I have my past child self, teen self, and my fut- my past adult selves that have informed and helped me create from the present moment. This to me is important. And I want to say a couple more things here as we talk about this. Change requires future-oriented action. What do I mean by that? It means that I take actions in the present moment with an intention for the future. And this is very hard to do. We know this from psychology research. It's very hard for people to make choices in the moment about money, about their health, these kinds of things that will make them better off in the long run. This is why people don't always contribute enough money to their savings. People don't always, they usually eat the donut now to get the, you know, the sort of the satisfaction now rather than forgoing the donut now so that they can lose weight and be healthier later. We all know this is sort of how it is. And part of what we do and part of the reason for that is that we don't focus on being in dialogue and becoming a friend with our future self. So from my perspective, one of the things I want to say about this is that to me, just as you dialogue with your past, and this is what most people do most of the time, this is why they stay in bitterness, they stay in regret, they stay in feelings of betrayal, they behave in the world a particular way. It's because they wrote stories about their past and they, in, they dialogue with those stories and those parts of themselves only. Instead, what you want to do is start writing stories about your future. What will it look like in general? And more important, so that you can be in collaborative intention, what will it feel like? How will I think, act, and feel? Which really is the definition of being. When you are in complete alignment between thinking, feeling, and acting, this is being. How can I be now in the present moment so that I can feel something in the future. And this is brings us into this idea of manifestation, visualization, and sort of meditation. So usually when people think of meditation, they think of sitting down on the couch in lotus position and oming, right? And just focusing on your breath. This would be, you know, sort of present focused meditation. What I'm saying is that you add a visualization component to this meditation. And this visualization component basically has you seeing your future self but more importantly, feeling your future self. So you're looking forward and being in your visualization. It's like psychological dress rehearsal. And then on top of that, you go out and act it out. So let me give you an example. When I was going, when I was rewriting the dumb jock story, I was looking towards my future smarter doctor self, right? I decided right then I'm going to go be a doctor. I don't care what anyone says. And what I began to do is I began to visualize that. I would just sit there and think about what I need to do and how it's going to be. And I would see myself reading books, like literally in my mind's eye. 
I would visualize myself reading books. I would visualize myself making A's on tests. I would visualize myself getting into college. I would visualize myself even not getting into college and then trying again the next year, eventually getting in, just simply not taking no for an answer. I also, when I woke up in the day and got dressed, I dressed like my future smart self. I put on glasses. I put on nicer clothes. I, you know, stopped wearing gym clothes around, you know, to school. I began to function differently. So it wasn't just that I was visualizing in, you know, sort of this meditative state. It was also that I was doing this out in the world presently, acting as if I was already the thing, meaning I was being it until I could see it. And what I was doing and what that meant is that I was in deep dialogue with my future self. I was no longer in deep dialogue with my past behaviors. And this is the thing that I think people miss. What they are usually doing is they are in deep dialogue with their past selves and all the things that happened in the past. And that's informing who they're being in the present. Instead, what you want to do is get in deep dialogue with your future self and get in deep conversation and understand that so that that can begin to influence your present self. And this really is manifestation and visualization and all these things you hear about distilled down in a very simple way. Ultimately, if you have a clear intention and you can tap into what the emotion of that looks like and feels like, you now have like a compass. This compass begins to start pointing due north towards your next level, best future human self. But how can you do that if you're in constant dialogue with your past? So this is what I want to focus on. And not only that, but if you're being authentic to your current self and saying, I'm done with my beliefs. I, my beliefs are my identity. I'll never believe anything differently. I eat this way. I think this way. I'm this political persuasion. I'm all these things and I'm not changing. That also is problematic. Instead of being authentic to your present self and your past self, you need to be authentic to your next level human potential. And in order to do that, you need to get into deep dialogue with your future self. And the way you do that is twofold. One, you begin to visualize what that looks like. Try it on as a dress rehearsal. This is like a meditative process. And second, you begin to think, feel, and act to the best of your ability in alignment with that future vision. And then you allow collaborative intention, your clear intention, your feeling about where you're heading and life to bring you there. The way I like to think about this is imagine a river. This is a very Taoist way of looking at it. You're sitting on a river in a canoe and the river is flowing in a particular direction. That is the direction of the future. That is the arrow of time. What a lot of people do when they're focusing on and more in dialogue with their past selves is they're turning that canoe around and trying to row upstream. And that becomes exhausting. And what happens is that oftentimes leads to the repeated patterns, recurrent obstacles, et cetera. You're not going to be able to do that long. So you're going to get worn out. You're going to run into a rock. You're going to be thrown or flipped over and you're just going to get exhausted and then float downstream and not know where you are. And then you're going to try again and you're going to fail again. And you're going to try again and you're going to fail again. It just doesn't work. Now imagine that you instead from the present moment, allow the river to pull you. And you look intently downstream. This is the clear intention. And you essentially gently guide yourself with a rudder to avoid certain obstacles and to point yourself into certain areas that are beneficial or look promising for your future self. So maybe there's an eddy down the way you can pull into a nice, you know, shallow area. You can get out and fish or whatever it is you're going to do, but you let the river pull you. This way you're in collaboration with it. But it doesn't get to determine fully where you go because you're looking downstream and you know what your vision looks like. So when you start seeing a particular bend in the river or the river splits, you already know what your future looks like. So you know which direction to go. You know the choices to make. You know the moves that you're going to make from the present moment. You cannot be in dialogue and in authentic authentic expression with your past self or your present self. You must always be in authentic dialogue and deep discussion with your future self. 
And I would even suggest that you try to see from this future self's point of view. You try to predict and treat it as if it's your best friend. And in this way, you can be in dialogue with all your parts, but all of them should be in service of your future self, the little child self contributing to the lessons, contributing lessons that it learned, the teenage self contributing the lessons and understanding that it has, the different versions of your adult self contributing the lessons and the behaviors and the understandings and insights that it has, and all of that coming together in your present time to create your future self. So it's not that these other parts are discarded. In fact, they're integrated. Those lessons are integrated. And in fact, those lessons, those experiences, those insights of your past self hold all of the clues about who you should become. In other words, your past wounds, your suffering is a great source of meaning and understanding. Your pain can be a path to purpose. Oftentimes, the things that we are meant to do and want to become are directly related to the things we've suffered from and the lessons that we've learned. And this is why we get stuck. So the idea of the future self is something that you need to be in discussion and dialogue with. And so I'm going to end that discussion here, but I hope that makes sense and can begin to be something you can begin to anchor to as you work to your next level human self. Appreciate you all. And I'll see you at the next podcast. You have been listening to the Next Level Human podcast with Dr. Jade Tita. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe and consider leaving a review. You make the biggest difference when you pass on your lessons and inspire others. That's why reviews like this are so powerful. Your words may be the only ones that resonate for someone else. Please remember the information in this podcast is for educational purposes only. Always consult your personal physician or therapist before making any lifestyle changes. And finally, thank you for who you are in the world and the difference you make.